This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting today's show is Kansas Farm Service Agency Agricultural Program Specialist, Nicole Wellborn. She provides information about grassland CRP and continuous CRP opportunities from FSA. K-State Wheat Production Specialist, Wamilo Lolato, continues today's show with a report from the 2023 Hard Winter Wheat Tour of Kansas. On Tuesday, they traveled the northern part of the state, and Wamilo says they saw many abandoned fields and can expect yields to be lower than last year. The Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts finished today's show with a conversation on supplementing cattle versus planting warm season forage. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today on this Wednesday. And to start today's program, we're having an FSA update from Agricultural Program Specialist Nicole Wellborn. Nicole, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Glad to be here. And Nicole, today you kind of wanted to touch on Grassland CRP or Conservation Reserve Program. To get us started, what is it? Well, Grassland CRP is a voluntary working lands program that contracts with producers to protect grassland, including rangeland and pasture land. The CRP participants under Grassland CRP, they develop conservation plans that work alongside their hay and grazing operations. And in return, FSA provides them with annual rental payments and potential cost share assistance. And so first to touch on, this is a voluntary matter. Not everyone has to participate if you don't want to. Absolutely. Yes. All of our CRP pro signups are voluntary. So this is just one more branch of that conservation reserve program that are, is available to producers. And I touched on that working lands component. This is the first of its type under CRP, whereas you get to continue to hay and graze and harvest seed production off of that acreage um, according to an approved conservation plan. So it allows you a little more flexibility with what you do out there that works with your current operations. Kind of touching on first, if people are wanting to sign up and are thinking about possibly doing this, which they'll learn more information as we go on, the deadline Mm -hmm. is May 26th. However, you should not wait until May 26th. And why is that? It is not recommended you wait until the last day. All offers that have to be fully processed in order to be submitted by that sign-up deadline. And when I say fully processed, you visit your county FSA office, you indicate where you want the grassland enrollment to be. So then they need to look at that acreage, make sure that the land's eligible according to the program, that the producer's eligible according to the program requirements. So there is some pre-sign-up or pre-enrollment steps that must be taken before we can fully process and submit that offer. So that's why it's recommended that you go in prior to the May 26th deadline, just to make sure that we can get all of our ducks in a row, if you will, to make sure that your offer is timely filed. So what are some things that producers would need to include in that offer or that paperwork for the FSA? Usually, generally, if you want to enroll, you have your farm and and your tract and all of that stuff established with FSA. But in some of these, with it being um, there's eligible rangeland and pasture land included, which means that it uh, doesn't have to have a cropland designation. So there may be some elements of it that have to be removed as far as structures or watering sources, acreage underwater structures, trees, um, bare earth, stuff like that is not eligible under grassland CRP. So some of those have to be removed from the offer, which takes a little time as far as working with your county office to get those removed out of that offer. And then of course, making sure that all of the ownership records and that those are up to date prior to submitting the offer. So just some of those housekeeping issues um, we want to make sure are all squared away and taken care of so that the offer is approved and not we don't run in any snags. And you mentioned this as a continuous CRP, and it sounded like producers are still able to be on their land and do a few different things. What does that look like? Sure. So like I said, they will develop a conservation plan 
And that entails if you are currently grazing the land, you can continue to graze the land according to the conservation plan. There are certain restrictions that apply during um, the primary nesting season, which in Kansas is April 15th through July 15th. So there's no haying during primary nesting season. With regard to that, uh, the haying and grazing operations can, you know, as long as they're within that conservation, that approved conservation plan, which you work through and develop with our sister agency, NRCS, you can continue those operations. You don't have to. You can maintain the acreage for wildlife benefits as well. So it's not a requirement to do haying and grazing, but it is an option for you if, if you have acreage out there that maybe isn't eligible under other types of CRP signups, but you still want to make sure or you still would like to get it in the program to maintain and, and get that annual rental payment. If land is in CRP and if that is expiring, is it eligible? And what other land is eligible for this? Sure. Yes. Acreage, expiring CRP acreage is eligible to be offered under grassland CRP. Um, also, additionally, this year, expiring grassland reserve program, which are some um, older contracts um, under a, a previous program that is now obsolete. If producers out there have any expiring GRP or grassland reserve program, it's kind of confusing, but <laughs> there have those out there uh, that's eligible. And also new for this sign up period, FSA National Office is working with our sister agency in RCS to allow um, potential acreage that is currently under an EQIP contract, which those are with NRCS, though we're accepting offers into Grassland CRP for this sign up um, if it is under a current EQIP contract. Now, we don't have all the details. Those are forthcoming about how those two programs will work together. So we don't have any of the details. But what we do know now is that even if your land is under a current EQIP contract, we will accept offers into Grassland CRP for those acres. And Nicole, how long are contracts or could be the contracts for Grassland CRP? Grassland CRP contracts are either 10 or 15 years, and there are additional ranking points that are provided for longer term contracts. So if you decide to go 15 years, there are some additional ranking points that you can get towards the offer for that. And so when all of the sign up closes on May 26th, the submissions will be ranked on several different ranking factors. Could you touch on what those are? Sure. So to name a few, there is the grassland cover composition. So both introduced and native grasses are allowed um, as the existing grass cover. And then you get certain points based on that grass cover composition. So the producer self-certifies for that. The location of the acreage relative to national and state focus areas, if it's in a national priority zone as determined by the National FSA office, or if it's in a state priority zone as determined through state FSA and conservation partners. And then, of course, the rental rate offered and various other factors, uh, beginning farmer provisions apply, veteran farmer provisions apply. And Nicole, just to kind of recap the grassland CRP, could you touch on some high points that you want producers to remember if they're thinking about applying for this? So again, the contract or the sign-up period ends May 26th. You want to contact your local service center ASAP to get in there to make sure we can fully process your offer. Grassland CRP has to have an existing grass cover with a less than 5% tree canopy. And when you go in, the offers will be, you, the imagery will be reviewed, and there may be certain areas of the offered acreage that will need to be removed based on the land eligibility requirements. So that's why we want to make sure that you get in there for the May 26th deadline. Make sure that you're an eligible producer as far as owning the land or operating the land for at least 12 months prior to sign up, unless a a waiver could apply. And at that point, we would have to file for a waiver. So all of these factors play into what we mean by if you the sooner you can get into the FSA office, the better. Absolutely. And I want to touch on one more CRP um, program that the Farm Service Agency has, and that's continuous CRP. Could you touch on what that is? So continuous CRP is generally smaller tracts of land considered more environmentally sensitive so some of those practices include um, wetland restoration, waterway construction, 
wildlife habitat borders, um, cropland bordering streams and other water sources, and then, of course, cropland in areas targeting wildlife species that are threatened or declining. So there are several areas within Kansas that are eligible under our um, safe state acres for wildlife enhancement, continuous sign up. And those would target, of course, we have one for lesser prairie chicken, we have one for upland game birds, and then we have one for playa restoration out in western Kansas. So all of those factors play into the continuous. It has a lot of different branches, but it is available continually throughout the federal fiscal year, which is October 1st through September 30th. So if you're interested in that, please do visit or contact your local FSA service center for more details and they can provide you with what may be eligible in your county or area. And for people, what website can they go to to find possibly where their FSA office is? Sure. So fsa.usda.gov has a list of uh, local service centers um, you can search for. And then also farmers.gov which is our public facing and and producers set up accounts on that. That also has information regarding where your service center may be located or in relative to where your physical location land is. Nicole, I appreciate you coming in and sharing some information on these two CRP programs. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. That was FSA Agricultural Program Specialist Nicole Wellborn. The websites that she referenced in today's program will be linked in today's show notes, which can be found on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue today's show with a wheat tour update. Currently, people have been traveling across the state and looking at what Kansas wheat is currently doing. And in to give that update, we have K-State Wheat Production Specialist, Romulo Lulato. Romulo, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Shelby. It's great to be here. So I said you're on this wheat tour, and yesterday you made 318 stops. Where was the tour started at, and where did you end up? So yesterday we started the tour in Manhattan and uh, the six different routes the tour has. They went either northwest or southwest of Manhattan, and they all moved west all the way into Kobe, covering the north central part of the state, right? So uh, today we're going to go over the southwest and south central, but yesterday we're, we're covering the north central and northwest corners of the state. So that was the tour route uh, that we had yesterday. And on those routes, obviously, you covered a large spacing across the state. What were you seeing? A very variable crop, very variable crop. I think it's one of the stories of the crop this year. Once we left Manhattan, honestly, I was expecting better crops in that uh, Clay County, Cloud, and Washington that's just like just immediately west of Manhattan there uh, because that region got some rainfall or, or at least more than what western Kansas did, right? And so I was expecting to see slightly better yields at that point. However, we were getting many 25 to 35 yield bushels per acre estimate there, which surprised me because that's a region that very often in this tour we will do 60 to 80 bushels per acre crops. So I was expecting at least to see perhaps a 40, 45 in that region, and we were getting 25 to 35. So when we started off right out the bat there, uh, already on those low levels, I I realized that it would be more concerning than I was originally expecting. As we moved west, I think that we were seeing more and more symptoms of winter kill in crop. So that north central region of the state, I think that we were seeing actually a combination of both winter kill and drought stress. Right. So I think that it was a that drought stress was of course damaging the crop quite a bit, but it was worsened by the winter kill that we had. Uh, during the winter, just like in December, that we had a few days where temperatures got to around, well, to the teens there and stay there for, for I think, seven or ten days. That really hurt the crop more than we were expecting in that immediate region just west of Manhattan there. Another thing that called my attention in the street was the impact that we were seeing from cropping systems, right? And so in that north central part of the state, for example, 
which that was clearly grown after a fallow period, was in decent shape. You know, it had some decent new potentials there, measuring about 35 to 45. Now, wheat that was grown after soybeans, which is the majority of the wheat growing in that region, um, it was suffering. I mean, we had some terminated fields. We, we had fields that were probably in that 15 to 25 bushel per acre range. So a really large impact of the cropping system in this year's crop. And then as we were moving uh, further west towards that Phillips, uh, Norton County, and, and Decatur, so in that region, we got really, really tough, Shelby. I think we were, um, I've never seen in the eight years that I've done this tour, I've never seen as much crop abandonment as we're seeing this year. So we were stopping at a field that just like you, you, you knew that the farmer was going to abandon that, so we weren't even sampling that field. Uh, but very, very frequently in those counties, right, uh, west of Phillips County. So very tough conditions. And I heard that from the routes that were more in the south part as well, that when they were west of around Great Bend or so, uh, it got really tough. And as we moved to the far northwest part of the state, like um, Rawlings County and Thomas County, you had a better potential, right? So that region actually got some snowfall during the winter, uh, more than other parts of the state, and I think that that helped a lot of the crop, uh, had some moisture from that snowfall, uh, although a lot of the crop even just emerged after that snowfall as well. So there's a lot of spring-emerged crop out there this year that has also more limited potentials. That's kind of the, the gist of it for this year, at least for the first day, uh, just kicking off out of Manhattan. Uh, it was much worse than expected, although better than as we moved towards central Kansas and that western part of the state has got even worse and worse progressively with the exception of the last year of counties or perhaps last second year of county in the western part of the state. So, Rami, look, I kind of want to take you back to a point you mentioned earlier. You talked that we've had a little bit of recent rain in certain parts of Kansas, but not really seeing a positive impact with that rain with the wheat crop this year. Well, I guess it depends, right, on the crop stage and depends on how far the damage had been before, right? So for many of these fields that we that we drove by or they stopped that today, the rain was too late. It was, was too late. So uh, uh, there is really no potential there that was established in the fall or whatever potential was established got actually decreased with winter kill during the winter there. And so for many of those fields, that, that rain was too late. Now, for fields that were hanging in there, right, so perhaps, as I mentioned before, in terms of cropping systems, right, so perhaps some fields that were after fallow or, or, or along these lines that were able to hang in there a little bit better, uh, that rain would, would still be very helpful, right? So, uh, actually, right now, we're still stopping just south of Colby, and there is <laughs> there's moisture in the field here. We got some rainfall last night, and the crop here is behind and off. They too, you will still benefit, right? So, that's another thing that I didn't mention, but maturity uh, ranges quite a bit this year as well from uh, the early portions of grain feeling as we were leaving from Manhattan uh, and then we progressed in earlier parts of the crop cycle so the, the, the crop was further away from harvest in this northwest part of the state where at that slightly to boot stage. So uh, a, a large range in development as was kind of expected before but again depending on the stage of development of the crop and how bad the conditions were prior to those rains uh, would play a big role on whether this crop will benefit from their rain or not. Also, Romulo, you mentioned that yields were not looking very favorable compared to last year's yield, almost down 10 bushels. Do you expect to continue to see that as you travel? That's a really good question. And yes, yields were down about 10 bushels from last year. And if you ask me that 29 or 30 yield, bushels per acre yield estimate that we came up with yesterday, it's really the potential of the crop that will get harvested in this region. So a lot of things are playing here, right? So first, there will be a lot of abandonments. We're not counting those fields. So whatever is left, which should be the crop in better shape, is what we're talking about having that 29 to 30 bushel per acre potential. Again, with the caveat that we're considering a good weather from here moving forward. If things turn south and, for example, we have heat stress or just continue to be dry in parts of the state, that's why mine will, will, will likely even go further down. You asked about what I expect to continue seeing the rest of the street. I'm expecting that today is going to be the hardest day uh, because today we're moving south to west. And historically, based on the, 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 the season conditions, that's where we're seeing the worst 
of the crop or hearing about the worst conditions of the crop. In fact, talking to some growers out in southwest Kansas, had a grower say, well, I will harvest 400 acres of wheat out of more out of my 4,000 acres planted. Right, So that's like a 90% abandonment. I heard growers in parts more towards the central part, like west central there, saying that they're probably abandoning, abandoning 25 to 30% of their crop. So uh, we're hearing some very large numbers, um, you know, anywhere from, depending where we are in the state, again, from 20 30% uh, in, in that southwest part, right, all the way until 90 plus percent abandonment. So I think the conditions are going to get progressively worse as we move to southwest Kansas. And then, as we start moving east again, back to which time, the conditions should start getting progressively better. But I don't expect that they will get truly better until at least east of Platte County or so. Meaning, there's a very large region in the south central and southwest part of the state that is in this condition as well. And that's what I expect to see today. And so a lot of variable across the state and a lot of just different conditions not creating positive effect for producers. But there is a little bit of positivity that you've seen on this wheat tour. Well, I guess at least there's no diseases, right? <laughs> we we usually think of diseases being um, associated with rainfall, right? And so the more rain we have, usually the more at least fungal diseases, right? Stripe rust and leaf rust and um, maybe some of the stem spots, Victoria, usually the more of those we will see. Uh, now, being as dry as we've been, at least uh, that has not been a concern. Another positivity maybe was in terms of uh, insects. Usually we would expect in a dry season, as we have had here, to have more issues with uh, with insects and diseases that are transmitted by, the, by, by, by some vectors, such as wheat streak mosaic that is transmitted by the wheat chromite. But surprisingly, it has been a very low insect and viral disease incident season as well. Um, we heard something about brown wheat mice back in uh, early spring, and I've heard of some growers praying for that. Uh, but that was about it. And so very low in terms of diseases and insects, which I guess it would be a positive point, uh, although that is associated with lowering fall as well. Romulo, I appreciate you coming on and giving us an update from day one, and we look forward to talking to you tomorrow um, for an update from day two. I appreciate you joining us this morning. Thank you, Shelby. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to share what we're seeing here with the Kansas Wheat Grower. That was K-State Wheat Production Specialist Romulo Lolato giving us an update from day one of the Wheat Quality Council's 65th Annual Hard Winter Wheat Evaluation Tour. He'll join us again tomorrow to give an update from day two. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be joined back by the Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today for BCI's Ask the Experts. We're joined with Brad White, Philip Lancaster, and Bob Larson. Hi, welcome to Beef Cattle Institute's Ask the Experts, where our experts will answer your questions. And I've got two great experts here with me today, Dr. Philip Lancaster and Dr. Bob Larson. So on this program, we get a chance to answer your questions. And as they answer the question, they get up to 10 points for their answer. Today's question is a great one because it's based on as we're coming into summer and worried about dry conditions. And if my forage supplies are low, am I better off to supplement the cows or plant a warm season forage? Philip, I'm going to go to you first. Well, I think, I mean, this is a tough decision. Obviously, it comes down to economics to start with. But with low hay supplies, probably have to transport it a long ways. I'm going to make a pretty good assumption that hay is going to be extremely expensive if you're not going to have enough pasture to make it through the summer. And so the other alternative is to plant a warm season forage that is drought tolerant. Obviously, you're going to have to have some rain. But or if you've got a little bit of irrigation that you can use, but some drought tolerant forages that you could graze through the later half of the summer to extend pasture and get yourself through summer and before you have to start feeding hay. Okay, excellent. So five points out of the gate for Philip. Now, Bob, what about just providing a supplement to the cows? Well, I think as Philip said, a lot of it has to do with availability and cost. So if I have some locally available, and that might be some byproduct feeds or something like that, which are, you know, quite a bit more energy and protein dense than our forages. So 
quantity isn't that much in that I'm not expecting to deliver as much, but but it still has to be available. And so there are times when cows are supposed to be out grazing forages during the summertime. But if there's not enough forage, uh, we do have to come up with something. And if there's locally available byproducts, that's that's a good place to start looking to, to really ex- expand or extend the, the grazing days. Okay, so I'm going to stay with you and follow up on your supplement question. So am I better off to wait until I need it, I run out of grass, or should I supplement when they've got grass out there? Because you said it, this is a weird time to be, odd time to be supplementing. It is. It's going to be situationally dependent, but I I think you would start thinking about it now and really looking to, to see how bad am I, how bad is the situation. And so I would rather start early than late because that gives you more options to, to adjust as time goes along. Situationally dependent still counts as it depends. It, well, it does. <laughs> so you had eight points, but you would drop back to seven. So, Philip, what type of forages are you thinking about there? So the most drought tolerant that we can plant are the sorghum sudans. Now, they have some setbacks or some disadvantages to using those. But they're going to be the most drought tolerant. There are some others. I can use some pearl millets. Um, those are annual, summer annuals that will work, and they don't have some of the disadvantages that the sorghum Sudan grasses have. I can also do some things with crabgrass, and that is also doesn't have those disadvantages. But the pearl millet and the crabgrass are not as drought tolerant. So I'm going to have to have more rain or more irrigation water for those than I would for the sorghum Sudan. So there's a trade-off there. And do I have to have a specific place to put these? Because I can't just put these in my pasture. You're talking about having a separate place or are you talking about overseeding? Well, you could overseed. I think you could overseed. If you've got a pasture, say you grazed it early and you know it's going to be dry, you could overseed it with some of the sorghum sedans. You come in with a no-till drill and drill it in as long as you've got a pasture that's accessible with equipment. That's obviously going to be a a factor there. But you don't have to have separate acreage. Um, You could overseed these into a normal pasture, particularly like a Bermuda grass would work well or something like that. Depending on what kind of pasture mm-hmm. you've got. And I, I like both those approaches. So as you think about any last thoughts on making this decision supplement versus going forward with planting a different variety, Bob? Well, I do think that uh, producers that can use the sorghum Sudan, that, that can be a great option, but you do have to be aware of the health issue, which is high nitrates. If you've not fed this forage before, you need to, to talk to some your veterinarians, some agronomists, anybody that can help you really understand how to avoid the nitrate risk. Absolutely. I think great comments from both of you today. Bob ended up with nine points. Philip ended up with eight. Thanks for joining us. If you have questions, you can send us an email at bci at ksu.edu. Once again, that was the Beef Cattle Institute's Brad White, Philip Lancaster, and Bob Larson. That's all we have for today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more tomorrow.